This is the Brad House Sports Show. And now for this week's completely different and humorous perspective on everything sports, here's Brad House Mike and Sidekick. All righty. Well, yes, indeed. Something looks very, very spooky here on a very different Frat House Sports Show. Coming to you right here from the Frat House the day before Halloween. We've got Sidekick coming to us via Skype and sitting in as our in-studio co-host. Well, you've heard us mention him many, many times before, our own Uncle Mark. All right. And I want to thank both you guys for making this show happen uh, this evening. Uh, Sidekick, we're going to jump right into it with you right away. Uh, we're sitting here. Game six of the World Series is going on as we speak. And you were actually supposed to be joining us from Boston this evening. Uh, but unfortunately, that kind of fell through. But you yeah, are joining let's us. Yeah, not get into that. <laughs> well, okay. No, I understand. But you are actually joining us, though from a, well, I was going to say pre-game, but I guess now it's an in-game yep. get-together. Where are you right now? I am at a local uh, sports bar uh, and not, uh, you know, yes, enjoying my beverage. Yeah, I was going to say, you sound like I, you're at a sports yeah, bar. There we go. For sure, you sound like you're at a There we go. One. I got a line of shots lined up here. <laughs> okay. For- for all uh, the Cardinals home runs. I was going to say, now that's in pre- that's in preparation of celebration, hopefully not in uh, preparation of depression, I would think. Um, Everything's a celebration. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, you know, there you are. You're at that sports bar, and I guess just kind of like the Super Bowl, we're not allowed to mention where that is. But uh, we'll let everybody imagine where you might be. Listen, let's talk about this uh, World Series for a moment, because we reported right here on this show uh, last week uh, last Thursday, we had mentioned that the cards had dropped game one in Boston last Wednesday. But then they took game two last Thursday evening and they split that series with Boston. And a lot of hopes were alive, including your own, obviously. The Cardinals then came home to Bush Stadium for game three on Saturday. And they took that game uh, up from the Red Sox and they went up two games to one. And, and it, it certainly appeared at that moment that they had the momentum. In fact, many of us right here uh, at the frat house were speculating, well, hey, there may not even be a game six at that point. But then the cards dropped games four and five on Sunday and Monday at home. And you definitely had the, to say that at that point, the momentum had shifted in favor of the Sox. Wouldn't you, sidekick? Yeah, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I don't like the momentum thing as much uh, with these two teams. Uh, you know, they both deserve to be there. Um, you know, the Cardinals, you know, they've got, you know, they got their two wins. Mm-hmm. Boston, you know, you can't disrespect Boston. You have to respect what they have. And, you know, they're the highest, you know, the highest rated offense, you know, in baseball. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't, you know, it, it's hard to say momentum swings because they're both great teams. And, you know, this series is coming down to who makes the bigger mistakes. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, now you're talking about offenses, and you're bringing up that Boston's got the highest-rated offense. But when you take a look at the Red Sox, the killer really has been, in this particular series, David Ortiz. Um, he's really the only one on that entire Red Sox team that has been doing anything at all. In fact, I saw a graphic just yesterday uh, reflecting that Ortiz is hitting, I, I think, over 700 in the World Series while the rest of the Red Sox team is hitting, what, around 125. The cards, it would seem to me, just have to stop pitching to him right now. Wouldn't that be the strategy? Well, you know, it's funny you bring that up because, you know, I was talking to mom earlier today. <laughs> Hug the mom. Um, and, you know, we were talking about that, about why, why aren't we pitching around David Ortiz. And mm-hmm. the problem is that Boston has stacked their lineup around David Ortiz. So you've got to deal with Pedroia and... Napoli and Ellsbury and you know so you know either you pitch around them and you have to deal with another threat or you've got guys on bases you know and it's hard you know it's hard to kind of pitch around them when you've got people on the base already right um so you know I think Matheny's just putting it in the hands of his pitcher and saying hey 
you got to go out and get this for us. Right, and you got a pitcher that's going there this evening. The Cards have given the ball to their rookie midseason sensation tonight, Michael Waka. Um, it, it, obviously a must win for them uh, this evening, but you're going to a rookie. But it's going to take more than that, it seems to me, Sidekick. It's going to take more than Waka to get you guys to a Game 7. Well, you know, this is, uh, you know, an elimination game for us, <laughs> as we, you know, so so like to call it. Uh, yeah, you know, Michael Waka's on, Mike Walk is on the wham. Oh, wow. <laughs> Man, need another shot. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> you know, he... He's been, you know, hitters have been hitting 122 off of him yeah. in the in the postseason, and he's been lights out, nearly lights out for us. You know, unfortunately, Boston has been able to beat Adam Wainwright twice, mm -hmm. um, so we're relying on Waka. And you know, let's let's be honest here. You know, Pedroia, Napoli, Ellsbury, Big Poppy, Fat Bastard, David Ortiz are going to have to sit down tonight because Walk is on the mound. Yep. We're going to take Game Six. There's no doubt in my mind that we've got yeah. this. We're going to go to Game Seven. Game Seven is on Halloween. I'm a little scared about that game. Uh, it looks like we probably have Joe Kelly going to the mound for that. And it's really going to be a crapshoot. I mean, it's going to be a one-game playoff at this yep. point, I think. Yep. Well, I love your spirit. I think that's terrific. Pardon the pun on the spirit thing. Love your spirit. Love the fact that you're going to uh, hang in there with them. Uh, and, and listen, we're going to let you get back to your pregame uh, or I guess in-game festivities there at that uh, unnamed uh, sports bar that you're at. But we're going to bring you back in uh, during the show to go over our NFL picks for this week. So we're going to catch up with you in just a few moments. All right, Psychic? All righty. You got it. We'll be back to you in a moment. Yep. All righty. Well, let's get into some motorsports and helping us out uh, with that this evening. Uh, well, we've got uh, our own Uncle Mark. Uh, how you doing this evening? I'm great. I'm yeah. great. Loving it. Yeah. Loving well, it. I, I, I got to ask, uh, what are you, a Hurricanes fan now? Yeah. Hurricanes well, no, sport? no. Listen, yeah. listen. No, no. This is what it is. First of all, it's Halloween. Uh -huh. You got to dress up in costume. Yeah. Number two. Well, a year ago, who can remember, huh? What the we Carolina were going Hurricanes? through? Oh, well, how about okay. All right. hashtag gotcha. suck it, Sandy? Right. There's one for uh, <laughs> sidekick. Uh, and number three, well, you know, just to remind folks, we're here for all teams, all sports. NHL, we'll be getting into some of that. Yeah, we will. Absolutely, be. absolutely, we're absolutely. Gonna be. You got it that right. All right, but tonight though, we're going to talk a little NASCAR. How about that okay. one? And we had Chase Race 7 this past Sunday down at Martinsville Speedway. Uh, a track that, well, not surprisingly, we saw 17 cautions, 15 lead changes. How about that, huh? You wouldn't expect anything less from Martinsville. Uh, one of those lead changes, well, how about it went to uh, Chase Driver and first time 2003 winner Jeff Gordon. Uh, and if there was ever going to be a first win uh, for the season, uh, well, you would think this would be the one for Gordon to get, huh? Couldn't have come at a better time, a more opportune time for sure. As I pointed out, chase race number seven. Um, and we can see again this week, the leaderboard got changed up just a bit, but uh, it's an imp just for just a handful of drivers, really just a handful of them. And let's go over this one a little bit, Uncle Mark. Uh, big win. Obviously, we got a tie going on up here, but... Big win, it would seem to me, for Jeff Gordon uh, as he jumped from number five to number three. Oh, without a doubt, because as we know in, in the Sprint Cup series, it's very hard to go up. Right. But it's easy to plummet back down. Had this been a week ago and Jeff Gordon was still sitting back at number five, he's probably out of contention. But all at once, he's heading into Texas, a track he's won before, mm -hmm. and he could very well make the most of that number three situation. Uh, to his own benefit, yeah. absolutely. Now let's take a look real quick. When we're talking about numbers and we're, we're taking a look at, at, at where things stand, and again, we only have three races left. Uh, we have a tie at the top between Matt Kenseth and Jimmy Johnson. Gordon now is only 27 points behind them. Harvick is now 28 points behind them as well. That's only one point behind uh, Gordon. Kyle Busch now in the 36th position. Let's go to talk about Kyle for a moment. Because you just made the observation that had this been this week that we're looking at it at following Texas and Gordon's down there in the fifth spot, which is where Kyle is, we might be talking about a different situation for that fifth spot driver. So the question I've got is, 
Did Kyle Busch, with his 15th place finish last week, perhaps did he run himself out of the chase? I would say not. Listen, we know how Kyle can run. And let's not forget something. Kyle won at this track before right. from the pole position mm -hmm. and went all the way. Uh, <laughs> how about back in April? Okay. So this track is, is certainly something that Kyle knows about and certainly can run at. All right. We got chase race number eight coming this Sunday, and we're heading out to the mile and a half Texas Motor Speedway, as we just brought up. Coverage of that race begins, uh, nicely enough for all of us watching football back here on the East, at 3 p.m. on yep, ESPN. Right, at 3 o'clock. And that means we need some fantasy suggestions from Sidekick, and brought to us this week by Uncle Mark and our friends down in the Baltimore area at Herb FM Sports Internet Radio. Check them out at www.herbfm.com. I need a little help. We're going to be looking at our fantasy. <laughs> what do you got for us? Well, don't you worry. It's going to be one of your favorite kind of tracks. It's a <laughs> super speedway. We're not talking about a little paper yeah, yeah, clip no, short track. No, we're going to the real deal. And it's non restrictor plated racing, right? 24 degree banking. This has the makings for a very, very fun race, unlike, well, Talladega, huh? mm -hmm. which last week's Martinsville was a lot more fun. Uh, real quick, second race at this uh, racetrack uh, this year, back in uh, April, they ran uh, race number seven. And interesting, our top five, how'd they finish? Uh, Matt Kenseth, our leader, uh, finished 12th. How about that? Uh, Jimmy Johnson finished sixth mm -hmm. top 10 hmm, but disappointing uh number three this week jeff gordon well he only completed 306 laps at texas last time uh with a suspension problem so he didn't even complete the race uh kevin harvick number four he's never won at texas he ran a 13 and once again kyle bush how about it number one back in April at this track from the pole. There you go. So you can't count anybody out. You can't really count anybody in. Okay. So uh, let's have a look at what we think. All right. For our Texas Hold'em. I'm writing them down. All right, and here we go. My number one pick is gonna be Kyle Busch at okay. 2850. He's a potential two-time winner uh, to sweep this in the same year, and he would join the likes of Denny Hamlin in 2010 and Carl Edwards to okay. in uh, 2008. So not bad. Of course, our you know one of our co-leaders, Matt Kenseth, 29 bucks, still slightly better than uh, Jimmy Johnson at this track. So that's why I'm giving him the nod. Okay, I've got to give a shout out to Carl Edwards in my number three spot for 25 bucks. That's a real good deal. <laughs> He's our three-time winner at Texas. How about the leadingest in Texas of our Chase Division pack, uh, including two sweeps. How about 2005 and 2008? So Carl Edwards has a lot of gas in the tank, and he could certainly get you some fantasy points. Okay. Uh, let me switch up. There we are. Uh, number four, David Reagan. You got to like this guy. He runs well at Speedway Tracks. Uh, specifically restrictor plates, but this is still a great track for him. And let's not forget what he did at Talladega back in May. This guy wound up winning. Mm -hmm. So it's anybody's game. And my lucky dog pick, sponsored this week by Herb FM, sports at HerbFM.com. I'm giving a shout out to Landon Castle. He's just $6.50. This guy will get you place differential. This guy can get you some qualified passing. He's a good fantasy point risk. He's not going to hurt you. I love the skull and crossbones for Halloween. Har, har, har. I want to be a pirate. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean I'm and not an expert? that takes our roster to 99.25. Say that. 75 cents to get a betting slip. We got two fantasy NASCAR experts in the house right here. Where are you going to find that? Anywhere else. Not going to find it. All right. Nice job. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's go take a look at some football, and we are at the exact midpoint right now of the NFL football season as we enter week nine this week. So we're going to talk a little bit of football, but we're going to kick it off with a little bit of collegiate football chat with a number one of our friends and colleagues over at Coach and Player Magazine, 
Earlier this week, Sidekick and I had a chance to talk and chat with Eric Purdy from Utah about the impact of the big name football programs in college football. So here's a little bit of that chat from earlier this week. Okay, well, listen, we're thrilled again uh, to have another another writer from Coach and Player magazine this evening. And we're joined this evening by Eric Purdy. Eric's coming to us all the way from Utah. Eric, thanks for being with us tonight. Pleasure to be here. Now, you've got a feature up right now on Coach and Player, which I got to tell you, I, I really, really enjoyed. It was very provocative. Um, I got to be honest. I agreed with a lot of what you said in it. There were a couple of things I might not have agreed with. But the name of the feature right now that's up there is the name game. In, I don't know, 35 words or less, Eric, give us the lowdown on what the name game is all about. Well, you know, it's been for years now since the BCS has been implemented. It's all about who you are, the money you make on your brand, mm -hmm. and players that the media wants to bill as the golden boys. You know, no, it, it, there's no attention going to the teams. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, it's not about how good you are. It's about how big your name is. It's, uh, it's for instance, the clowning in the, this year with South Carolina. Before the North Carolina game, all I heard all day was Jadavion Clowney. This, this, all this. The guy played what nine, nine, ten plays the whole game. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's it's about media attention. Who the media wants to say is good mm -hmm. is going to be in the top ten. You're not going to make any money. Nobody's going to make any money if if they're not in the top ten. Well, now you, but however, you make the point you're saying since the BCS, but really, you know, I got to take a little bit of exception to that. Wasn't it the same way back even before the BCS? Look, we've always had the polling situation, and polls have always been subjective, haven't they? You know, there's one poll I believe in and will always believe in, and it's the guys that are on the sidelines, the coaches, mm -hmm. the coaches poll. They are there every Saturday, all week long. They see they see the games. They watch the games. They coach the games. They know the players. Their pull is, is one to me that counts. Uh, and right now, for instance, in my article, I mentioned Florida State jumping Oregon. Every poll out there but the BCS poll has Oregon unanimously number two. I got to be honest with you. Sometimes, though, I look at the coach's poll a bit skeptically, saying to myself, wait a minute, it's a good old boys network. They're going to push one team over another, Yes. You know, I, I'm uh, my vote's out on that still. Uh, I, I've, you know, you hear you hear stuff about how Nick Saban didn't even vote for Alabama one week. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think I, I, I don't think that's the case. I, I, I would take that over the BCS poll. Uh, I, I, I believe that there's someone that pro you have to program a computer for the computer to make a decision. Do you not? Well, a person programs that computer. They put the numbers in the computer. They punch a button. And really what comes up on that computer is what they want. It to but isn't up. that fair if we go with an algorithmic system? Wouldn't it be fair just to have the computers pick it? It seems to me then you don't have any subjectivity. That, that, that could be a possibility. But I still think, I think voting is a major factor that needs to play into it a little more. Mm-hmm. I think the public needs to vote more. You, uh, I like that. I like that concept a lot. Now, you brought up uh, South Carolina. I couldn't agree with you more. In your article, you also brought up Louisville. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm sitting here with my Big Ten colors on. You know where I'm coming from. I'm a traditional sort of guy coming at, at, at college football. Uh, I, who else in your well, mind right now is overrated who's in the top 25? The top 25 overrated? Yeah. You know, they're starting to fall off now. They are. They're, they're starting to fall off now. I, I, more than overrated, I would say there's teams out there underrated now. Mm -hmm. That's probably a better subject. For instance, Alabama right now has the inside track to the national championship. Until somebody beats them, they're number one in my book. Mm -hmm. Okay, But now, at the beginning of the season, who would have thought Missouri would be doing what they're doing in, in the SEC? And the way it's shaping up right now, you have a very good showdown coming between Alabama and Missouri for the SEC championship game. Mm -hmm. And Oregon and Baylor are two other teams to watch out for. Baylor still has three top 25 opponents left on their schedule, and they aren't just beating nobodies by 70. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're beating conference opponents by 70. And they're holding opponents. Oregon gives up points, and, and but they put them up. 
Psychic, I think what what Eric is saying is this comes down to a philosophical issue, really, in many respects, philosophical right. issue about, hey, if you've got the name brand, you're going to make the bolts. Right. Well, exactly. And that's we were talking about a little bit pre, you know, uh, pre-taping. This is one of the reasons why I don't get into college football. Right. Yeah, I root for Penn State. You know, I went there for, you know, for a little bit and I I root for, you know, Mizzou and stuff like that. But I think, you know, I think the whole system is a joke, mm -hmm. you know, with polls and this that and the other, you know i'm sorry i'm a good old mid you know we were talking about i'm a good old midwest boy i want to i want to see divisions i want you know get get the playoffs based on your records mm -hmm. and your accomplishments not on who you are and how much money you have and stuff like that you know i want to see some of these other teams get a shot at doing something than you know notre dame and you know, Notre Dame, who's not even in a conference. Yeah, yeah right. Not yet, you know, anyhow. Not yet, anyhow. You know. Well, you're, you're, a, you're a Big Ten guy. Uh, I can tell you that another team that might be underrated right now, if, you, if they're looking at Florida State hopping the polls like they did, why are we not talking about Ohio State, who hasn't lost a game in two years? Uh, they, that team right there is Ranked number three, though, right now. Yeah. Yep. And, well, they're number four in the BCS. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so if you, I think they're definitely more deserving than Florida State. Oh, I would agree with you there. I would agree I, I, with you there. Uh, let's go back though to the philosophy of this all, and, and let me bring up a, a, a point that I think might satisfy some of what Sidekick is even talking about. Uh, let's go to the NCAA tournament in men's basketball. That thing is flat out fair. Why can't we get to a system like that in uh, football? Is it because of Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three? It's time. It's it's the length it would take to play that out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just too many schools. Uh, college football season, at one point there were nine games in a season. Now it's 12. Right. You could High school football could be an example, maybe, because they play nine games in a season, and then they have a full playoff, and you take two or three teams from each you know division, and they play single elimination. And, and, but with college it would just be too tough trying to get all those games in you would need to really justify being where you're at at the end of the season. Plus, there is far too much money in bowl games, not just the BCS. Schools rely on that bowl game. There are schools that will settle. Yeah, For instance, course. my area, BYU. Right. They will settle to play in the Holiday Bowl, the Vegas Bowl. They get that guaranteed check. That's good enough for them. Mm -hmm. Sure. They, they rely on that money every year. And then you get to Northern Illinois. They get that one big paycheck. They get that great year. They go and get that paycheck. They can ride off that for a couple of years. Okay. Let me ask you this. Now, we've got, uh, we already know that the BCS structure, all right, is going to change modestly. When is it supposed to go into effect? Next season? Next season. Is that going to make any difference at all, or is this just a whitewash? Actually, I almost think it's going to be worse. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, now, now you're narrowing it down even more. Uh, it, it's going to be the SEC versus the SEC. Yeah. I mean, that's, the oh, SEC is wow. right now to be the top conference in college football. And not just saying that media-wise. The, the, the SEC is top quality football. The Big Ten yeah. is as well. You're not going to see parity like at least now in the bcs system they're giving one or two at large mid major so-called programs right. an opportunity to show what they're about by going undefeated or even like we saw last year one loss and getting into a bcs game with the with the playoff system that's basically the bcs hiding behind the playoffs gotcha gotcha eric we appreciate you ben, uh, being here with us tonight you brought up something that Chris Franklin's brought up uh, before on the other shows. I got to get you both of you back on and talk about one of my big nemesis, and that's the SEC. And we're going to do that. We're going to get into that so one of these days. We're going to get into my rant on the SEC. Eric, thanks so much for being with us. We're encouraging everybody to get over to Coach and Player, read this terrific article, which basically says, hey, it's media-driven, it's money-driven, it's the name game. That's what it's all about. Eric, thanks for being with us. Thanks, gentlemen. It was a pleasure. You got all it, man. Right. Many, many thanks to Eric Purdy and our friends over there at Coach and Player for their insightful NCAA football chat. Uh, do me a favor. Make sure that you're getting over. You're checking out their website over at www.coachandplayer.com. Okay, we've got Sidekick back in here with us. And I say, as I stated at the top of the show, it's a very different version 
of the Frat House Sports Show this evening. So, gentlemen, what do you say? We uh, let's jump right ahead here, and we're going to take a look at some of our NFL matchups for this weekend. We're going to make our picks right now. Uh, and as always, our picks are brought to us by our friends Carl and Jim over at CLW83.com. Make sure you check them out and all of their original broadcast programming. All right, and we're going to start it off this evening, guys, uh, with our first one for this weekend, and that's the Baltimore Ravens at the uh, Cleveland Browns, and that's the 425 game on Sunday. We've uh, talked a lot about the defending Super Bowl champions uh, this year already. And, uh, well, where are they right now? They're coming off a bye after losing to the Steelers in Week 7. Now, as I pointed out, we've talked a lot about their struggles and their woes. Uh, Ravens going into this weekend right now, currently three wins behind the Cincinnati Bengals. In second place in the AFC North. And it, really, when it comes right down, well, let's get it straight, they may not make the playoffs. It appears to me, in my assessment, the next two to three weeks will actually tell the story of any postseason hopes for the Ravens. In another season, we would not even be emphasizing a matchup between the Ravens and the Cleveland Browns. And in fact, I got a bit of frat house sports trivia here for you. We have never, ever highlighted the Cleveland Browns on any of our pick segments in the past three seasons. But we're doing it tonight. The Browns are a surprising three and five. After having gone through, what has it been? Three, four quarterbacks? I've lost count. Uh, already this season, the Browns, right now, they, they just recently lost by six points to the unbeaten Kansas City Chiefs. The QB du jour for the moment, Jason Campbell. Actually didn't look bad. Going 22 of 36, 293 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, 105.4 QB rating. Gentlemen, it's obvious to me that Vegas doesn't have much confidence right now in the Ravens as they are a mere two-and-a-half-point favorite over the Browns. Do we have an upset in the making this weekend? What do we think? Psychic? Well, ah, man. You know, the Ravens, the $120 million man has not looked that good this season. Mm -hmm. I'm going with the dog pound to ruffle up the Ravens' feathers. I'm going with the upset special this week. I'm going with... Cleveland. There you go. Uncle Mark. Well, you know, I still hold out hope this Super Bowl team is going to come through. It's the Browns versus the Browns. Let's get it straight. This is the Browns of the old versus the Browns of the new. Right. I'm going with the Dirty Birds. I'm going with Ray Rice to actually put up some numbers this week. I'm going to pull for that $120 million quarterback. Flacco's going to come through. They're going to right the ship. Give me those dirty birds. How about this one? Sidekick, you might not expect this, but I'm going right with you. I'm in the pound with you, and I'm going for the upset. I'm picking Cleveland. I have been so terribly unimpressed with the Ravens this season. I think Cleveland and Campbell are actually going to pull the upset. Flacco is wacko. Bet on Jacko. <laughs> Okay, let's go take a look at game two, and that's the Indianapolis Colts at the Houston Texans, and that's the Sunday night football game, 8.30. The Colts uh, are coming off a bye uh, from last week. Uh, after surprisingly beating the Broncos in week seven, 39-33, Andrew Luck had a pretty good day, and has the Colts right now sitting atop the AFC South, despite being NFL's 23rd ranked QB in the league. The Texans, on the other hand, are a team seemingly going in reverse from last season. They're coming, up, coming off a Week 8 bye after a very close loss to the Chiefs in Week 7, where they only lost by one point. Rookie QB Case Keenum actually looked uh, pretty good uh, against the tough Chiefs uh, defense, landing himself a 110.6 QB rating. Like the Ravens and Browns game, despite the Texans' woes, the Colts are just a two-and-a-half-point favorite. Gentlemen, shouldn't this spread be a bit higher, it seems? That spread should be a little higher to me. Sidekick, where are you going? Well, I'm, you know, it should be higher. The, you know, the Colts are going to gallop on down into Houston, and they're going to put a whooping on those Texans. Mm -hmm. I'm going with the Colts. Yep. Uncle Mark? 
Ah, Casey Keenum's going to be like Casey Kane. Kaysen, he's going to send a long-distance dedication. So watch these Houston Texans come back this week. I'm telling you, coming off a bye, I think they're going to right this ship. I think they're going to surprise a few people before the season's over. We're only halfway. I'm going with the Texans for the upset. Case Keenum might have looked pretty good. Maybe have even surprised a few people down there in Houston, but I'm going to tell you right now. That Houston team just looks like a team that's completely without direction whatsoever on the field. And I'm talking about on the field. When you watch the game, no direction. I'm going with the Colts as well. All right. Let's go take a look at our third game of the weekend, and that's the Chicago Bears at the Green Bay Packers. And that's our Monday night football lineup. Monday night's uh, been rather lackluster this season, but we might actually have ourselves a good one here. The Bears were on a bye last week. Who wasn't? Is there a team I have? I think everybody was on a bye. Uh, but in week seven, they lost starting QB Jay Cutler in their 45-41 shootout loss to the Washington Redskins. Bears QB understudy uh, Josh McCown, he wasn't half bad. Uh, but really, the highlight reel for the Bears that particular game, how about three rushing touchdowns from Matt Forte? Now, we talked about this. This is a classic rivalry, make no mistake. This, though, is a bigger game for the Bears in their postseason hopes as they sit in third place in the NFC North, but just one win behind the division-leading Green Bay Packers. The Packers uh, played the one-man Minnesota Vikings uh, on Sunday Night Football last week and came away easily with a 44-31 win. And uh, once again, well, look, there's, there's Aaron Rodgers, again, sitting in the top 10 ranked QBs in the entire league. And it's no wonder with all the weapons he's, uh, he has. And, uh, well, hey, just for good measure, the Pack have actually uh, thrown in a little bit of a running game this season. The Pack are a 10.5 point favorite in this one. Guys, are the Bears being disrespected here? That spread seems way too high to me. Way too high, particularly in light of the fact this is a in, you know, interdivision rivalry. Sidekick, what do you got? Oh, yeah, t- totally, uh, I think, disrespected. You know, this is going to be a, you know, NFC North uh, matchup here with, you know, interdivision, like you said. Yep. You know, this is going to be a slobber knocker, you know. This is going to be a knockdown, drag out fight. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, though, I think Green Bay is going to edge out the, the Bears on this one. Mm-hmm. So, you know, discount double check. Yes, there you go. Uncle Mark? Well, you know, I mean, Cutler uh, not being in the mix is going to affect this game tremendously. It's going to take a totally different look. Uh, Matt Forte, touche, absolutely. But I don't think he's quite enough. Uh, got to like a uh, guy like uh, Jordy Nelson, uh, uh, favorite receiver right now with Aaron Rodgers. You know, this one's a real tough one. NFC North, I like the pack. Going with the cheeseheads. There you go. Trifecta coming all the way around. I'm going with Green Bay as well. As much as I'd like to see Chicago win this one, and I've got a little more confidence in McKellen, I think, than maybe you two are expressing, but nonetheless, I think Green Bay wins this one, but not by the 10 and a half. I think if you're playing the points, you want to take Chicago, but if it's head to head, go with Green Bay. Okay, let's go take a look at game four, and that's the Kansas City Chiefs at the Buffalo Bills. We're going to go back to a 1 o'clock game now on Sunday. I brought it up last week, and I asked the question, when will the Chiefs take a loss? Well, it wasn't last week. Uh, As I mentioned before, they took care of the Cleveland Browns 23-17. So if we want, we can have that conversation all over again right now. When are the Chiefs going to take a loss? While Alex Smith is making all of his naysayers look foolish right now, I think you'd have to agree that this team really is the league's second leading rusher. It's Jamal Charles. That's who this team is. Uh, Would it be safe to say that if he went down, this team would be in a lot of trouble? Seems to me. On paper, this 8-0 matchup against the 3-5 Buffalo Bills looks like a slaughter just waiting uh, to happen. Now, despite the carousel of QBs, the uh, Bills have featured out on the, f- on the field uh, the entire season, going back to preseason. This one, to me, is a real head-scratcher, uh, as the Chiefs right now are just a three-point favorite over the Bills. Guys, what's going on here? We just got done talking about the Pats 
or the, the, the Packers being, you know, uh, with a point spread way over this one, it doesn't seem like it's high enough. What, uh, sidekick, what do you got? Well, this is my uh, bomb diggity bomb pick of the week sponsored by CLW83. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Go get them, guys. Listen. Okay. Um, so we got the Kansas City Chiefs at the Buffalo Bills. I think Vegas is totally disrespecting Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs. Hmm. Um, you know, come on. It's Andy Reid. They're going 9-0 and against the Buffalo Bills. There you go. Plain and simple. Uncle Mark, what do you got? Oh, yeah, candy apple red, absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting, this from a coach, Andy Reid, used to be right here in the Philadelphia market, <laughs> never used a running game. Jamal Charles, Dwayne Bow. Alex Smith quietly, quietly just identifying himself as a quarterback of his own. Yep. I'm liking the Chiefs to go 9-0. and I keep saying the powwow's going to end. They're going to fall off. Not this week. I agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. Interestingly, you know, I made the observation. You make the observation. Uh, Andy Reid running the ball. But, it, you know, when he was with Philadelphia, it wasn't for want of a, of a running back. He certainly had them. But, nonetheless, I think in this particular matchup, you do have to go with KC. They're going 9-0. and I agree with you, Uncle Mark. They're going to fall off one of these weeks, but not this one. Not this one. All right, Sidekick, we're going to let you get back to your in-game festivities that are going on there Woo at your local sports bar. Uh, and let me let you know that all of us here at Frat House Sports, while we're rooting for the Cardinals uh, to push the World Series to a Game 7 tomorrow evening, we're all right there with you and hoping that happens we'll catch you yep. in a bit have a good night and we'll get you back here next week next week see you game seven baby all righty all righty well hey many thanks uh to our friends jim and carl over at clw83.com for sponsoring our weekly picks of the week all right there you have it uh very different show this evening as i pointed out all through the whole thing we're mixing everything up tonight but i still think we have uh, i think i think we have about four minutes remaining And now, four minutes of football. All right, well, listen, all of us that tuned in uh, to that entertaining Dallas Cowboys-Detroit uh, Lions game last Sunday saw the Des Bryant meltdown occur live on the air. Now, we've all seen it all over the Internet all week long. And uh, while it was obvious that none of us at home could tell what really perpetrated that or, or what the problem was, it certainly appeared that Bryant uh, was pulling one of his numerous sideline temper tantrums, which uh, occurred at a time when the Cowboys were actually leading the game 13-10. to 10. He was mouthing off at coaches, assistant coaches, and eventually it got quite animated uh, with uh, DeMarcus I Aaron haven't got a brain. And Jason Witten involved. Uh, it later came out that Bryant was uh, pushing his uh, leadership role by trying to get his teammates fired up. Now, over in the Eagles-Giants game, Michael Vick left the game just before halftime uh, with a re-injured hamstring. Uh, he portrayed his leadership by sitting on the bench with a towel over his head while rookie QB You're Matt Barkley me, went into the game and struggled. So, uh, my question to you, Uncle Mark, which one showed the better leadership? Oh, boy, I'll tell you what. We've got lost leadership right here on both sides of the ball. Let's get it straight. Calvin Williams was badly, badly dissed uh, by this man, okay? Uh, how about the owner, Jerry Jones, coming out basically saying to put out the fire, well, you know, if I just had Dion back, he could shut down Calvin. Uh, I don't know, Des Bryant, a little bit too far off for me as a fan, even yeah. looking in from the outside. Yeah, I might agree. Um, I, don't, I don't know. The owner's even saying it's not prime time uh, quite yet uh, for uh, Des Bryant. Uh, as far as Vic, well, I don't know. I mean, lost leader? Yeah, absolutely. He's got a towel over his head. You can take the fight out of the man, but I don't know. In this case, I think you take the man out of the fight, too, yep. dog. Yep. Hmm, hashtag broken. Yep. All right. Yep. All right. Uh, now, here's one for you. I want to throw this one at you. This week, former New England Patriots and current Washington Redskins safety, Brandon Merriweather, 
said essentially to the media, listen, if I can't hit them high, I'm going to hit them low. I'm going to take out their knees. You got to mess up people's careers. You got to tear ACLs. You know, Brandon Marshall from the Chicago Bears uh, had a response basically saying, maybe you should be taken out of the game. Mm. Okay. Uh, now, look, Michael, this is a brutal sport. We got rules changes. Uh, a lot of these defensive players trying to get their heads around it. We're trying to, uh, you know, defensive players, how do you prevent concussions? Let me ask you this. Is, is Brandon Merriweather uh, at this point just on meltdown? I don't have a problem <laughs> with what Merriweather said because basically what he was doing was responding to the way that the NFL has implemented these rule changes. You can't get a, hit a guy up high. Where are you supposed to hit the guy? He's speaking out of frustration. I don't have an issue with what he said. Uh -huh. I think it was really tongue-in-cheek. That's really where I came, feel, came down on. And Goodell has already said he has no intention of, in fact, fining Merriweather for his comments. Might be right, but it could be brace on knee for ACLs if this man's serious. Well, if he is. Now, let's talk about another guy that did some injury, and that's Carolina Panther Mike uh, Mitchell. Was fined by the NFL the other uh, day. How about $7,875 for his hit? on St. Louis Rams, Sam Bradford, uh, the week before which ended Bradford's season. Now, it wasn't so much the hit, it was more the celebration that he did on the sideline. Mitchell's response was, quote, to be honest, I think this is a little bit of targeting, of a targeting system uh, they have out. I think I'm one of the guys they, they've been looking out for, uh, but I'm okay with that. And when asked later on where he thought some of the money was going, he said, right in Roger's pocket. Right in his pocket, that's where it's going. Hey, I got a question. Is that finable talk or what? Sounds like finable talk to me. On camera, right in his pocket is where it's going. Uh, $45,000 in fines thus far, I'll tell you what. Uh, with the collective fines that Roger Roger is collecting from the NFL, this guy should be captain of the team in London. <laughs> All right, there you have it. There's our four minutes of football. A little bit longer than that, but that's all right. All right, listen, before we get out of football, let's take a look at our Frat House Sports Fantasy Football League real quick. And there you have it. Um, I've made it back up into playoff contention. Sidekick over there in his unnamed sports bar. You're down in ninth, but that's all right. That's going to change. That is going to change. Make no mistake about that one. All right, and uh, one more final bit of housekeeping. Let's go take a look at our Frat House Sports Facebook post of the week, and for the second time this month, uh, the post that got the most views, activity, comments, and shares was the original post of our Frat House Sports show from last week. Many, many thanks to all of you. Uh, keep doing that. Share the show. Get your friends and family to check it out. And also, give us a like over on our Facebook page, for gosh sake. Yo, man, we We're love you. We're almost at a milestone, and we need that to happen. Click, right. like, share, tell your friends. All right. Absolutely. All right. All righty. There's our there's our Halloween show. A very different one. Very. I don't know if we want to do this one every week. Oh, we'll see. Uh, but, uh, that's our frat house sports show for this Halloween season. There you have it. Uh, make sure, please, that you're going over and checking out our new frat house sports website. www.frathousesports.com. And in the meantime, you know what you got to do. Or not net. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm reading off the teleprompter. Somebody's got it. It's the cobwebs. It's the cobwebs. <laughs> That's what it is. www.frathouseworths.net. All right. <laughs> it's been a long night, folks. It's been a really long night. Though. You have no idea. You know what you got to do. Keep us real. Keep us live. Keep us going. We'll see you next week. I had to scratch you out. Yeah, I had to scratch you out. Right. Okay. And so Mark's going to go through his fantasy picks, and he knows that on the last one he'll be given the shout-out again to. Um, but you're going to want to move quickly because he's going to give his, quote-unquote, lucky dog, his lucky dog brought to us by Herb FM Sports. Bam. Is, there's his lucky dog. Pirate affiliated. Pirate oil field. Um. Uh, yeah. Uh, oil field. Yeah. Pirate oil field services is what they're called. And Marky wanted that little graphic. Yeah, I wanted that up because that's land, that's Landon Castle. 
And yeah. they're, they're out of Midland, Texas, which is right there. And I thought that was in keeping with the whole oh, Halloween motif, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, skull and crossbones. I, like I want to be a pirate. Higher, 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 higher. Walk the plank, shiver me timbers. Landing castle. He's driving the 40. Yeah, but